Hey folks, Pastor Jim Thomas from the Village Chapel here in Nashville, Tennessee with your daily devotion. Thinking a little bit about the cross and uh, this book here, The Cross of Christ by John Stott, one of my favorite Bible teachers of all time, uh, pastor, gifted evangelist, preacher, scholar, theologian. Um, uh, many years he served uh, there at All Souls Church in London, and he's uh, written quite a few commentaries, which I uh, have read. And as I've taught through different books of the Bible, he's been one of my favorites along the way. He says here, evangelical Christians believe that in and through Christ crucified, God substituted himself for us and bore our sins, dying in our place the death we deserve to die in order that we might be restored to his favor and adopted into his family. And I, that's a just, man, that's just a great way to, as, as he opens up that book, great way to start it. One of my other favorite uh, Bible teachers along the way has been Steve Brown from Key Life Ministries down in Florida. I remember him saying the problem with most of us, the very reason we don't love one another uh, we wear masks, and one of the reasons we're so dishonest is that at the cross, we only got saved. We didn't stick around to get loved. He says, when you get saved, don't leave. Stay there until you've gotten loved as well. It's at the cross of Christ where we find that kind of love. And that's exactly what Stott is talking about here as well in the cross of Christ. By, by the way, a book I would highly recommend. Uh, here's just a maybe an opening page or two for our reading time together here today. Uh, he talks about talking about uh, uh, an old painting, and I uh, maybe you can, you can look it up on the internet yourself later if you'd like to, but he says, do you know the painting by Holman Hunt? And he's going to describe it, so you'll if you're just listening today as opposed to watching, you'll still be able to catch the idea. But he says, there's a painting by Holman Hunt, the leader of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, entitled, quote, The Shadow of Death, end quote. It depicts the inside of the carpenter shop in Nazareth. Stripped to the waist, Jesus stands by a wooden trestle on which he has put down his saw. He lifts his eyes toward heaven, and the look on his face is one of either pain or ecstasy or both. He also stretches, raising both arms above his head, and as he does so, the evening sunlight streaming through the open door casts a dark shadow in the form of a cross on the wall behind him, where his tool rack looks like a horizontal bar on which his hands have been crucified. The tools themselves remind us of the fateful hammer and nails. In the left foreground of the painting, a woman kneels among the wood chippings, her hands resting on the chest in which the rich gifts of the Magi are kept. We cannot see her face because she has averted it, but we know that she is Mary. She looks startled, or so it seems, at her son's cross-like shadow on the wall. The pre-Raphaelites have a reputation for sentimentality, yet they were very serious and sincere artists. And Holman Hunt himself was determined, as he put it, to do battle with the frivolous art of the day. Uh, it's superficial treatment of trite themes. So he spent from 1870 to 1873 in the Holy Land and painted this painting, The Shadow of Death, in Jerusalem, as he sat on the roof of his house. Though the idea is historically fictitious, it is also theologically true. From Jesus' youth, indeed even from his birth, the cross cast its shadow ahead of him. His death was central to his mission. Wow. So he knew from early on and told his disciples about his own death over and over and over again. And that which for so many nowadays is merely a, uh, an item of jewelry, 
um, actually was a sign and symbol of something much deeper, even in some ways horrific, in other ways uh, victorious and liberating. Uh, here he writes the sign on, under a section called the sign and symbol of the cross. Uh, Stott writes this, every religion and ideology is visual symbols, which illustrate a significant feature of its history or beliefs. And then he gives a few examples, which I found kind of interesting. Maybe you will as well. The lotus flower, for example, although it was used by the ancient Chinese, Egyptians, and Indians, is now particularly associated with Buddhism. Because of its wheel shape, it is thought to depict either the cycle of birth and death or the emergence of beauty and harmony out of the muddy waters of chaos. Sometimes the Buddha is portrayed as enthroned in a fully open lotus flower. Ancient Judaism avoided visual signs and symbols for fear of infringing the second commandment, which prohibits the manufacture of images. But modern Judaism has adopted the so-called shield or the star of David, a hexagram formed by combining two equilater equilateral triangles. It speaks of God's covenant with David, that his throne would be established forever, and that the Messiah would be descended from him. Islam, the other monotheistic faith which arose in the Middle East, is symbolized by a crescent, at least in West, in, er, West Asia. Originally depicting a phase of the moon, it was already the symbol of sovereignty in Byzantium before the Muslim conquest. The secular ideologies of this century have also had their universally or almost universally recognizable signs. The, Marcus, the Marxist hammer and sickle adopted in 1917 by the Soviet government from a 19th century Belgian painting, represent industry and agriculture, and they are crossed to signify the union of workers and peasants of factory and field. The swastika, on the other hand, has been traced back some 6,000 years. The arms of its cross are bent clockwise to symbolize either the movement of the sun across the sky or the cycle of the four seasons or the process of creativity and prosperity. At the beginning of this century, however, it was adopted by some German groups as a symbol of the Aryan race. Remember, Stott is writing in the 20th century and uh, 19, published in 1986. So he's talking about that turn of the century for him. Then Hitler took it over, he says, and it became the sinister sign of Nazi racial bigotry. Mm. Christianity, then, is no exception in having a visual symbol. I love this. The cross. The cross of Jesus. This book, I'll read from it again. It's so good. It's such a brilliant treatment on the cross. Um, I have read before, probably you've heard me say this, but uh, folks like N.T. Wright would say the cross is the place where and the means by which God loved us to the uttermost. You've probably heard me say something similar from J.I. Packer when he said the measure of all love is its giving. The measure of the love of God is the cross of Christ, where the Father gave the Son to die so that the spiritually dead might have life. That's me, or it was me. Now I have life because of what Christ has done. It may have been you, and now you too have received life in his name. But if it isn't you yet, what are you waiting for, man? Well, wouldn't you want the life that is on offer to you uh, through the finished work of Christ on the cross and his glorious resurrection? Mm. I hope you're interested in that. Uh, if... Uh, you are curious about that at all, let me encourage you to visit our website at thevillagechapel.com or perhaps visit our YouTube channel for The Village Chapel, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and just check out some of the resources we have available to you there. Let me pray for us today as you get your day started. Lord, thank you for the cross. You didn't have to come and lay down your life for us. You didn't owe it to us. It wasn't that we had a claim on you wasn't that we deserved it even. You came to die for sinners like myself and for like my friends that may be listening or watching today. So 
Um, I pray for all of us, no matter where we may be on our uh, spiritual journey right now, that you would open our eyes to see the wonders of your love that drove you to come for us before we got it together, before we even believed in you or trusted or hoped in you. You came on the run with rescue in the form of this Redeemer, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, in whose name I pray today a blessing on each and every person that's listening or watching. Amen and amen. God bless you. Daily Devotions with Pastor Jim Thomas is a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. If you find this daily devotional beneficial, leave a review and share it with friends and family. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com. Artwork for this podcast by Kim Thomas. Music by Phil Kagey.